The concept of the archetypes is one of Carl Jung's most influential and yet also most misunderstood ideas. Anybody who first comes across the concept of the archetypes may note how vague and subjective the idea seems. The notions put forth by Jung seem so mystical that his theory of archetypes could be easily dismissed. The goal of this video is to demonstrate that the concept of the archetypes can be firmly grounded in biological facts and that the archetypes are evolved structures of the human mind. The Jungian analyst Anthony Stevens worked hard to integrate a biological and ethological approach with Jung's original insight, as he wrote in his book Archetype. Careful examination of the patterns of behavior as they manifest themselves in diverse human societies and in different species of animals leads the unbiased mind to the conclusion that Jung was right, that the collective unconscious contains the whole spiritual heritage of mankind's evolution, born anew in the brain structure of every individual that there are indeed universal forms of instinctive and social behavior, as well as universally recurring symbols and motifs, and that these forms have been subject to the essentially biological processes of evolution, no less than the anatomical and physiological structures whose homologous nature first established the truth of Darwin's theory. Archetypes can be understood as built-in modes of human behavior and thought which exist prior to birth. The word archetype denotes the fact that these behavioral systems are built into the psyche of every human, and that they don't need to be learned throughout the course of one's life. In one sense, archetypes are simply natural human instincts, which are inherited in our DNA. We can say that an instinct is when an archetype is manifested in behavior. Since these archetypal patterns of the human mind exist in every individual, Jung referred to this part of the psyche as the collective unconscious. As he writes, I have chosen the term collective because this part of the unconscious is not individual, but universal. In contrast to the personal psyche, it has contents and modes of behavior that are more or less the same everywhere and in all individuals. It is, in other words, identical in all men, and thus constitutes a common psychic substrate of a suprapersonal nature, which is present in every one of us. The collective unconscious is named as such because it is the inherited part of our psyche, which has contents that can be found in nearly all people because of the genetic similarities between all of us. The collective unconscious does not develop individually, but is inherited. It consists of pre-existent forms, the archetypes, which can only become conscious secondarily, and which give definite form to certain psychic contents. Just as our genome contains the blueprint for producing all of our internal organs, our genes also contain the blueprint for structuring the human mind, in order to deal with the typically recurring situations of human life. The idea of the collective unconscious was revolutionary for its time, because prior to Jung, it was believed that the human psyche was infinitely plastic, and the mind of each individual was shaped on a personal basis. Whereas Freud had assumed that most of our mental equipment was acquired individually in the course of growing up, Jung asserted that all essential psychic characteristics that distinguish us as human beings are with us from birth. These typically human attributes Jung called archetypes, he regarded archetypes as basic to all the usual phenomena of human life. Given what we know about genetics, it shouldn't be surprising that the human mind is also shaped by innate instincts or archetypes, which exist a priori. The archetypes have thus been shaped by a long process of evolution, stretching back over millions of years. Animals also possess archetypes, and these archetypes operate to give the animal a survival advantage. Stevens notes one example in chicks. If you hatch out a clutch of baby chicks, and then pull a wooden model of a flying hawk over their heads, they will crouch down against the ground and emit cries of alarm. This is an ancient defensive response, and it is innate. Moreover, one can raise generations of chicks without ever exposing them to a hawk, real or wooden, without extinguishing the response. An archetypal system, once it has evolved as a characteristic of a given species, breeds true as long as the species exists and does not disappear with disuse. In these chicks, the ability to respond to predators is archetypal, because it does not need to be learned. The chicks are simply equipped with this automatic response. This evolved behavior is a significant survival advantage, which helps the newborn chicks to evade predators. As Stevens writes, Such selectivity is inevitable. Any physical environment possesses immense perceptual complexity, and it is essential that the organism should confine its attention to those aspects of the environment that are most relevant to survival. Just as baby chickens are born with archetypes which govern their behavior, so too are humans born with archetypal patterns of thought and behavior, which are meant to help us throughout the typical situations we may encounter in life. 
As a human being develops and matures, there is a high probability that he or she will encounter certain situations, and the psyche has evolved automatic responses for dealing with these situations. These archetypes are innate in the human mind, and evolved in order to allow humans to make quick decisions when encountering the common circumstances of life, and so the archetypes exert a significant influence over our thoughts and actions. The archetypal endowment with which each of us is born presupposes the natural life cycle of our species, being mothered, exploring the environment, playing in the peer group, adolescence, being initiated, establishing a place in the social hierarchy, courting, marrying, child rearing, hunting, gathering, fighting, participation in religious rituals, assuming the social responsibilities of advanced maturity, and preparation for death. In other words, the human mind possesses different archetypes for dealing with the regularly occurring experiences of human life. We have one archetype which allows us to form social bonds, another which appeals to authority, another which allows us to flee in the face of danger, another which allows us to fight threats and identify enemies, another which impels us to find a suitable mate, another which impels us to be nurturing parents, and another which instructs us to pass off our knowledge to the next generation. These evolved characteristics operate in an unconscious manner and were very helpful during the pre-civilized state of man. However, these archetypes still exist in us today, despite our consciousness, and continue to exert a significant influence over our thoughts and actions. In order to give an understanding of what is meant by the archetypes, we will provide three examples of archetypes and their sociological ramifications, which will hopefully reveal that the concept is really quite simple. These are the mother archetype, the father archetype, and the anima archetype. In the future, we will cover each archetype in greater detail, discussing the historical, mythological, and psychological significance of each one independently. The mother archetype refers to the fact that every child is born with an instinctual desire to form a bond with their mothers, and to be nestled in her comfort and security. The mother archetype is the a priori system of the mind, which helps an infant form a mother complex with its actual mother in the real world. The archetype is the mental predisposition to form a mother complex, and the mother complex is the manifestation of the mother archetype in the real world. The mother archetype is the vital nucleus of the individual's growing mother complex. Originally, the archetype as such is unconscious. Then, as the child matures in close proximity to its mother, so all those behaviors, feelings, and perceptions determined by the mother archetype are released or activated with the consequent development of the mother complex within the child psyche and the associated coordination of the mother-infant behavioral chain in outer reality. The mother archetype evolved in order to give infants the best chance at survival, and children can become neurotic if their mother archetype fails to manifest. The father archetype is a similar instinctual behavior, but rather than being the child's desire to be nurtured, the father archetype is the behavioral system which causes the child to obey an authority figure. This archetype is perhaps somewhat misnamed, and a more modern term for it might be the dominant-subordinate relationship, something we have discussed in much detail in this video, as this archetypal system is well documented in nature. In human societies, the father is often, although not always, the first and primary dominant individual encountered by the child, which is why the archetype is named as such. The concept of the king and of God stem from the same psychological archetype, and we can think of the king as being a father figure for the collective society, and gods as being imaginary father figures, hence phrases like God the Father. This archetype is necessary for teaching the child the rules of society, and what is considered appropriate behavior. By representing society to the family and his family to society, the father facilitated the transition of the child from home to the world at large. He encouraged the development of skills necessary for successful adult adaptation, while at the same time communicating to the child the values and mores prevailing in the social system. The anima is an archetype which exists in men, and women possess a similar counterpart known as the animus. The anima refers to the feminine portion of a man's personality. As Stevens writes, Everybody carries qualities of the opposite sex, not only in the physical sense of contrasexual genes, hormones, and anatomical vestiges, but also in the psychological realm of attitudes, feelings, and ideas. Every man has an unconscious feminine side, just as every woman has an unconscious masculine side. By masculine and feminine, we are speaking about those attributes which are symbolically prescribed as masculine and feminine. This archetype has many functional roles, but one is in allowing us to select an ideal romantic partner. 
When a man experiences passionate attraction to a woman, it is because she seems to embody his anima, and she appears to him more beautiful, more numinous than any other woman around, often to the stupefaction of his friends who completely fail to understand what he sees in her. Whatever conscious reasons he may advance in explanation of his choice, they are in fact secondary, rationalizations merely. The primary motivation lies in the numinous quality of the activated archetype. Jung discovered the archetypes by examining dreams and fantasies of his patients, and noticed many uncanny similarities between them. Jung was also very introverted, and spent a great deal of time letting his mind wander, recording what occurred, and noticed that his mind produced images which were similar to those he found in his patients. As he developed his theory of a collective layer of the psyche, Jung turned to mythology and noticed that many myths also contained archetypal images and symbolism. This leads us to another common misconception about archetypes, and that is that they refer to common motifs that can be found in art and literature. This is one meaning of the word archetype, but Jungian archetypes refer to the psychological archetypes of the mind, and are not merely stereotypical depictions in art. Images and representations in mythology are not archetypes, rather they are influenced by archetypes. The representation of the Great Mother in mythology stems from our inner unconscious psychology. This explains why there are so many parallels between the mythologies of different cultures, and why, for example, the hero's myth is so ubiquitous. Archetypes shape our minds, and as a result, our myths tend to contain archetypal meanings, and the same archetypal motifs appear in different cultures because of the shared evolution of the human mind. In the modern world, our instincts don't play as important a role as they once did, and so there is a tendency for our archetypal nature to be repressed into the unconscious, where they appear in our dreams. By relating these internal archetypes to ideas in the real world through the processes of symbolism and metaphors, humans are able to grow in consciousness. Furthermore, myths tend to include a relationship between archetypes, which represent new ideas which expand the consciousness of mankind. Symbols take archetypes and produce new meanings, a process discussed in Eric Neumann's The Origins and History of Consciousness, a book we will closely examine in future videos. The relevance of myths to social life comes from the fact that, because these archetypes exist in the collective unconscious of all humans, they feel relevant to the individual lives of every one of us. Every person is the hero of their own story, and can relate to the journey of the hero archetype in mythology. If you are interested in more information, I have included links to several videos which discuss and explain Jungian archetypes.